Fifteen years ago, I published a book called The Legacy of Conquest, and then over the next couple of years, I told a lot of reporters and public audiences that Western American history was undergoing a revitalization and a renaissance. And then after I said that and saw those things appear in the New York Times and the Washington Post, then I crossed my fingers and I hoped that this would prove to be true. <laughs> well, thank heavens it did. Um, I should say, actually, speaking of gratitude, that everything I have published in the last 15 years, Ed Barber, my editor, is sitting right there, and I have, I have to say, I have to, I hate to say this, but I think I have more gratitude towards him than I do to the Gilder Lehrman Institute, and I'm very <laughs> grateful to him. Uh, well, thank heavens it did turn out that there was a renaissance in Western history. Renaissance history, uh, re pardon, Western history and renaissance history too, thrives as a field. It thrives in every dimension, maybe especially in the history of race relations and in the history of various aspects of human interaction with the environment. The field's paradigm truly did shift, and it was a real pleasure to play a part in that paradigm shift, though sometimes 10 years ago, the word pleasure would not have been the first thought to come to mind when shifting views in the field inspired a certain outburst of crabbiness, contentions, and complaints. I guess it's something that's just irresistible when a reporter comes to talk to you and you're a historian and you spend most of the time with people, reporters not talking to you, it's hard to get control of the valve at that point. And a few of the Western historians who were kind of unhappy about the change uh, spoke, I think, with excessive freedom to the reporters. <laughs> One of them said uh, that he, this was, I think he said this in 1990, he said that he was saving money personally to send me back to Russia. I thought, <laughs> well, back to Russia. Uh, I had never been to Russia, so if he wanted to send me to Russia, that would be an interesting experience. He didn't seem to have noticed the end of the Cold War. That was the striking thing, that there really would be no... <laughs> particular reason to send, him, to send me there. And then, of course, the goofiest part about it is the disservice and misunderstanding uh, directed at me that far from having my roots in Russia or any communist society, I am a, in Boulder, Colorado, I'm a member of the Boulder Rotary Society here, Rotary Club, rather. So I am a Rotarian, and I, have, I didn't wear my pin. Um, but, and I guess there are Rotarians in Russia, so I guess that will be fine. But it, <laughs> it was a contentious and not particularly pleasant phase in a way. But we came through that. Um, and in the midst of that time where contention was part of the paradigm shifting, I had a student named Jim Gibson in a class at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. In one of his papers, Jim used this very memorable line. I quote him, when shifting paradigms, it is important to remember to put in the clutch. <laughs> Now, this was valuable advice. It came a little too late. I wish I had had it a couple years before. And it turns out to be advice that it itself is becoming quite specific to a particular vanishing time period. Because in the last couple of years, you may have noticed, there have been stories in the newspapers about the disappearance of the standard transmission and the stick shift. Everybody has automatic transmissions. The New York Times story on this subject carried the headline, Dad, what's a clutch? And so in a few more years, if I quote Jim Gibson's wonderful line about shifting paradigms, audiences of younger people are going to look blankly at me and say, what's a clutch? Which will represent a paradigm shift in itself. And this time, I will not be on the winning side of that shift. So it is important to say, I own one car that does have a stick shift, so people can come to my museum and see that if they need to. Uh, so something in the soil, this collection of essays was, among other things, a record of what it was like to be a participant in that paradigm shift. I think it was probably um, a more visible and contested shift because so many dreams and hopes and yearnings are invested in the American West. If you revise, I hope this won't be invidious or unpleasant to say, but I think if you revise the history of Ohio, you don't get the strong emotions necessarily that you get if you revise the history of the real West or what people have imagined to be the real West. So the visibility, the uh, focus of so many yearnings of the imagination makes changing our story on the West really quite uh, a well attended to matter. So it is not surprising that we did grind the gears a bit in our transition, but I do believe we arrived at a more realistic way of viewing the history of the American West. Something in the Soil was also an effort on my part to see if I could escape from what I consider the eternal present of 1987. If I could explain what I mean by that, this book, The Legacy of Conquest, did come out now a full 15 years ago, and the freshmen who were in my classes were three and a half years old when it came out. 
so the notion of that as a recent book is getting, well, if only, I guess, I do have about 19 gray hairs and I have these glasses and I have other forms of proof on the passage of time. All this has brought back to mind a memorable moment for me when I was in graduate school. I had, um, I was very privileged and fortunate to have a class with C. Van Woodward, and of course half or more of the books on our reading list were written by C. Van Woodward in Southern History, and we all were quite paralyzed by how to talk about these books with this great author present. And at one point in our agitation of trying, we really truly did not know, were we supposed to say, did the author intend this, did Mr. Woodward, did you, did, could you leave the room so we could talk about this book? It was really kind of a challenge uh, to figure that out. And in one of our, our struggles over that, Mr. Woodward said, he was, we were discussing his biography of, of the populist Tom Watson, published, I think it would have been more than 30 years ago at that time, Mr. Woodward finally exclaimed, I really do not feel like the author of that book anymore. Well, I was 21 years old, and I was entirely bewildered by that remark. I thought, it says C. Van Woodward on the cover, this poor old fellow, how could he not know that he was the author <laughs> of that? Now I get it. <laughs> I'm afraid I didn't get it in time to write Mr. Woodward a letter and say, I totally understand now. What could he have meant? Well, the years go by. The book remains. The book has your name on it. The book continues to speak, and that's wonderful. But you change. You think new things. You have new thoughts. And yet to many readers, and indeed I think particularly to your critics, you are trapped in the eternal present of the year of the book's publication. It is a little like being a fly in amber, and they can say, uh, in spite of the fact that 15 years have passed, they can say, Limerick claims, Limerick argues, Limerick asserts, Limerick declares, and you think, Limerick declared, Limerick argued, <laughs> Limerick asserted, we're historians, we move into the past tense too, that's okay. Uh, it seemed impossible to persuade people to make that shift, because, and it seemed very important to give it a try though, because the context of 1987 is really very different from 2002, to use probably the most important Example, when I wrote The Legacy of Conquest, the West was in an economic downturn from the collapse of the latest energy boom, the energy boom of the 1970s and early 1980s. That was when I think Time Magazine had a cover that said something like region in ruins, region abandoned, and very melancholy phase for, uh, for people who were hoping for economic prosperity in the West. And then, by the 1990s, that had all reversed and the West had become the fastest growing region of the country. And this time, tourism, second homes, and recreation drove this new boom. So now, in 2002, parts of the West are actually heading back for yet another ride on the energy boom-bust roller coaster. So common understandings that made sense in 1987 in terms of what outcome we were um, attempting to explain, those understandings are looking winded now. And with that changed context, it is natural that other thoughts and understandings would enter a historian's mind. So that was the opportunity presented to me by Ed Barber with something in the soil to demonstrate that I had not come to a halt in 1987, that in the years that followed, I learned some new things, I reconsidered some old ideas, and I also figured out some of the implications of ideas that I still believed in, but now realized were more complicated and in many ways richer than I had realized um, when I wrote Legacy. So something in the soil gave me the opportunity as well to try to correct one of the goofier misrepresentations of the new Western history and the press coverage 10 years ago. And that impression that needed correction was the impression that a more realistic version of Western history was inherently and exclusively sad, melancholic, and dispirity. To make that point in the essays, I'm just going to read a little snippet here. Uh, the great desert writer, Joseph Wood Crooch, who actually was at Columbia in the earlier part of his career, then lived in Tucson and wrote about the desert. Before he moved to the Southwest, he had written a book called The Modern Temper, which was a very, very glum book about how science and rationality had stripped faith and meaning from the lives of sophisticated Americans. So 1929, he was touring after that book had come out and um, told this story later about his, his tour. He was scheduled to speak in Detroit to a women's club. Arriving at the train station, Crooch waited for the woman who was to meet him. She approached me, he reported, only after every other descending passenger's passenger had left the platform. Are you Mr. Crooch, she said. I am, he said. Her face fell. 
but you do not look as, 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 as depressed as I expected. <laughs> I have many versions of this story in which people come up after I've spoken to tell me that I am nowhere near as depressed, glum, bitter, or angry as they had expected, or I think actually hoped. An advanced reputation as the wicked witch of Western history can leave audiences easily disarmed when the author surprises everyone by showing up with a personality that bears a much closer resemblance to Judy Garland's Dorothy than to Margaret Hamilton's witch. Um, so, so this was a nice chance to say I am not glum. Um, well, every now and then, but that's in department meetings and those don't count. So, <laughs> It's nice being out of town, you know, you can say a lot of things. You can't really say in Boulder. My operating faith as well is that being serious about history does not require us to restrain or limit or squish or disable our senses of humor. Some dimensions of history are indeed far too serious and far too tragic to be funny, but in lots of other terrain, I think a sense of humor is one of our most valuable tools for reckoning with the complexity and vitality of the past. Uh, I thought I'd give one quick example of that. This is from an essay on John Sutter. John Sutter, when I was a school child in California, uh, we were told a great deal about John Sutter, but it was all about how he was the father of California and he had made uh, European settlement possible, American settlement possible, and we heard that quite a bit. Then on, um, in the late 1990s, it was the anniversary of the, uh, big part of the early, early 1990s, it was the 150th anniversary of his settling in California. There was a series of lectures on John Sutter. So I had the chance to speak about the Sutter that we now understand from uh, deeper historical research. Teachers in the room, I have to say there's still a problem here about how you present this material to children, but here is Sutter as we know him now, uh, and a way of using humor to raise questions about the appropriateness of pedestals for some historical figures. A few years ago, during a visit to Sacramento, my husband and I took a tour of Sutter's fort. In one room of the fort, a staff person undertook to instruct us on the subject of John Sutter's personal life. Sutter had a common-law Hawaiian wife, we were informed, but he dropped her and brought his Swiss wife to California. Receiving this news, the woman standing next to me in the group was moved to exclaim, Men, they never change. <laughs> Men, they never change. Well, that is one interpretation of the meaning of John Sutter for our times. S Sutter is often referred to as the father of California. <laughs> oh, you are a clever audience. This really, I can just go back to Boulder and they can do all the jokes on their own. <laughs> they really don't need me for this. So if Sutter, I'm going to read it anyway because it's what you all just thought. If Sutter did not, in literal fact, father California, that failure cannot be blamed on any lack of trying. <laughs> With his Hawaiian mistress and his many encounters with Indian women and with Indian girls, Sutter did not spend his time cursing his luck for having been born too early for the sexual revolution of the 1960s. <laughs> In these matters of personal behavior, behavior dampened but not ended by the later arrival of the wife he had abandoned in Switzerland in 1834, Sutter seems distinctly modern. I suppose by some standards, a presidential possibility for him. <laughs> that is not in the book. <laughs> So, uh, so that, was a, that was a good opportunity. Again, I do think there's still some big pedagogical questions because what Sutter did in actual life, I don't think is appropriate for a fourth grade curriculum. I'm not quite sure where you would get that material in, but it certainly made him, in my judgment, a much more interesting Sutter, and that was indeed the point, that keeping him on the pedestal had been an odd way of keeping him dull and letting him have as many dimensions did not uh, just decrease his historical interest, but in fact added to it. Now, the core of Something in the Soil is probably compatible with the book, The Legacy of Conquest. I had three or four main ideas in Legacy, and in some ways these essays do continue the themes, though again, I think they see them in a richer and more complicated way. Uh, I had the good fortune that a year or two after Legacy came out, Kevin Costner did Dances with Wolves, which would seem unrelated, and in fact was, but then when reporters wanted a chance to get historical perspective on that, they trotted me out. I got to be on the Today Show. I got profiled in People uh, because Dances with Wolves came out. It's kind of a goofy thing. Being profiled in People was a great experience because I, uh, have a, I own a cowboy hat, which I do not wear very often, and I own a fringe leather jacket, which I do not wear very often. And every time someone from an Eastern news magazine comes to take a photograph of me, they will not take no until I put on the cowboy hat and the <laughs> fringe jacket. 
and it doesn't even end there. I have to go outdoors and sit on a rock. <laughs> sometimes, this is actually absolutely literally true. This is really a, a very goofy thing because some of the photographers have come in February. And in Boulder in February, a fringe jacket is not sufficient for some weather. I was, I was kept by Life magazine, I was kept on a rock um, up, <laughs> up the canyon, up on, on Flagstaff Mountain. And it was, it was a day in February, and it literally was freezing. I had to be doing it because there were hops, a couple of hops circling behind me, and they were supposed to be in the picture with me. And so, so I stood up there, and I would get, I had, uh, oh, also it's important, a, a true Western writer would not wear a warm hat, so I had to, I, actually, they wouldn't, I didn't want to wear the cowboy hat because it was going to blow off in that wind, so my hair is streaming off to the side, and, and as a result, I had to be put in the SUV to warm up every 10 minutes because I was <laughs> shaking so badly. The photograph does have a lot of, it shows a lot of kinship, which I wouldn't have expected, between me and Theodore Roosevelt. It's very, got a very <laughs> definite, I am on the mountain, I'm in charge of the mountain sort of quality. And then, um, so I thought I had suffered more than anyone, and then it turned out that my friend Terry Tempest Williams in Utah, who's written about, about the Great Salt Lake, they made her put on hip waders and stand in Great Salt Lake in February. And finally, uh, the moisture got inside, and so they actually, the, they froze to her legs, and they were having to cut her waders off. And then, it turns out, when they actually ran the issue on Women of the West, they dumped me and put a stripper in Las Vegas who was standing on the top of the hotel in the uh, outdoors. But I did get a... <laughs> I guess so. I did get a lovely picture out of it. So, in any case, the whole point of this ridiculous digression is that I, being interviewed by People magazine, um, I did get to say the central ideas of legacy in four words beginning with C, and then it turned out that quite a number of my colleagues in Western history said, that is the best statement of your position I ever saw. What they were doing reading People magazine, I don't know, except the supermarket lines can get long. Um, but it is a wonderful service, and I think editors should probably encourage their authors to take 350-page books and turn them into four words beginning with C. Uh, convergence, continuity, conquest, and complexity, four Cs that I think would, would and did transform the field of Western history to something a lot more vital. Um, it turns out that, well, those core messages, first convergence, all of these I think correct misapprehensions in the earlier versions of Western history, convergence that instead of focusing so exclusively on the westward movement of white Americans, we would see the real complexity of movement into the American West. We would see the northward movement of Mexican people, Spanish people. We would see um, the sort of west and southward movement of French Canadians, the across the Pacific uh, eastward movement of Asian immigrants, and of course the prior presence of Indian people as important components of the story. So rather than the one-way movement, it would be convergence in, into that interesting meeting place of the West. The second C, continuity. Instead of ending the story in 1890, as uh, Frederick Jackson Turner and his followers had with the frontier ending and the significance of Western history ending with the frontier, we would see the 20th century West as a story of equal vitality, equal interest, and in truth a story where many of the issues raised in the 19th century remained open, unresolved, contested. Many of the things that people fought about on battlefields in the 19th century were then fought about in courtrooms and in legislatures and in Congress in the 20th century. So continuity for the second C. The third C, conquest, instead of the kind of fuzzy and undefinable word frontier, even Frederick Jackson Turner, its greatest exponent, actually says in his 1893 uh, Significance of the Frontier in American History essay, as you're trying to close in on him and figure out what he means by frontier, he says, the word frontier is an elastic one and for our purposes does not need definition. <laughs> and you think, you come back here, buddy, <laughs> and tell me what you mean. Well, it seemed to me better to go with a word we could define, conquest, by which we recognize the prior presence of Indian people and we see the struggle over the resources of the West, the land of the West, the control of the West, as an exercise of invaders coming into someone else's territory. And when the conquest was over, uh, there were more power, pieces of power, resources, uh, opportunities on the side of the conquerors and a very reduced supply for the conquered. So, third C, conquest, and then the fourth C, complexity, which is simplicity itself. You would think that everyone would recognize 
that any part of the planet that has human beings is going to be complicated. But there again, the yearning and the dream is so strongly for the West to be the place where you can tell the bad guys from the good guys. So as, as unnecessary as it seems, I think that fourth C has to be there. As I said for, I don't think it's in Legacy, but it became a useful way of making my point. Uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I took to asking people who worked with the public what percentage of people they encountered were jerks. This was not a scientific poll because I never asked if the person to whom I was speaking was himself or herself in that category, which would skew everything. Uh, but the percentages, very interestingly, are usually at about 10 or 15 percent. The 15 percent thing is what many people say. A cab driver in Washington, D.C., who seemed to have lead a life of high exposure, he said, I said to him, what percentage are jerks? And he said, only 5%. I said, my goodness, that's awfully low, 5%. He said, well, 5%, but they move around a lot. <laughs> so, sort of like counting bears in Yellowstone. You don't know when you're just counting the same bears over and over <laughs> again. Um, the fellow who installed our heater in our house in Boulder I asked him and the contractor, he said, 95%, I thought, oh my goodness, what a life he must lead and how much he must bring that out in people to have that happen. But uh, that's really the, the fourth C, is simply to say the 15% rule operates in the American West, and it operates with the 15% within every human being. It's not simply the 15% who have more of that quality in them. So those were the core messages, and those are messages that I think something in the soil carries out in ways I'll try to give some quick examples of. The basic point behind legacy and behind this book is still to ask people who teach American history, people who study American history, people who read it as a, as a passion and a leisure time activity, to pay attention to the West. The point uh, is to recognize that in many ways what we have in some areas, what's called American history, what some textbooks offer as American history could in many cases be justly labeled the history of the East Coast. No one denies that a lot of very important things happened on the East Coast. When you have New York and Washington, D.C. in your territory, you have an unquestionable competitive advantage when it comes to making a claim for historical significance. But still, if the category of American history is to make a, a if that's going to be the category, and if it's going to be an accurate category, a better reckoning with the western half of the continent does seem to be in order. At the time when Legacy came out, some people said, oh, this is a dead horse, Patty. There's really nothing to struggle for. Well, in 1992, I was asked to review college-level American history textbooks and check them over for their treatment of the West. That was a very instructive experience and certainly persuaded me that the issue was still open, that there was still much good work to do. Let me read a couple of sections from this description of uh, the textbooks, which... I have to say, when you sit down to read 12 American history college-level textbooks in a row, you know you're going to have something worth saying at the end, or it's going to be a tough way to live. Uh, they actually sort of sprain your thumb when you pick them up that much to keep reading, and they're quite a set. Well, here we go. In America, past and present, Robert Devine and his co-authors tell a story about the eastern provincialism of presidential candidate Al Smith in 1928. When reporters asked him about his appeal in the states west of the Mississippi, Al Smith replied, what states are west of the Mississippi? <laughs> his defeat becomes easier to understand here, doesn't it, at a certain point. Writers of the current crop of American history textbook have a certain amount in common with the ill-fated Smith. A few of them run into moments of trouble in keeping those big, square, evidently interchangeable states straight. Wyoming, most commonly, is the state injured. Erwin Unger in the United States moves the Fetterman massacre from Wyoming to Nebraska, and R. Jackson Wilson and his collaborators in the pursuit of liberty remove the Union Pacific Railroad from its accustomed route through Wyoming and send it south across Colorado. If you're thinking about the geography, that has really made a great burden on the Union Pacific at that, <laughs> that point. Such bloopers, however, are no novelty to Westerners who find it an equal challenge to keep the tiny states of the East Coast in some semblance of named order. That's my little <laughs> swipe back. Um, now, what was so crazy about this was discovering how much this assumption was in all of these books, literally all of these books, that the West was the frontier and the frontier was the West and the story was over in 1890. If, of all places to look with care, uh, 
It turns out the indexes, the indexes of these books are very revealing. The index tells its own story of a West with a limited lifespan. When West appears in the textbook's index, it is not only mobile, sliding to and from the Trans-Appalachian West to the Trans-Mississippi West, it is also terminal. Indexed references to the West stop before the 20th century begins. Regardless of the politics, methods, or age of the textbook's authors, the West registers as a transitory phase of national history and not as a permanent place. In a number of books, the index makes the subordination of place to process crystal clear. For frontier, the index entry says, see West. In other books, the word West does not even appear in the index and the phrase westward expansion takes its place. The West has its only meaning as an ephemeral zone on the edge of Anglo-American imagining and settling. Any Western resource booms and busts arriving or occurring after 1890 have simply missed the deadline. As late arrivals, the timber business in the Pacific Northwest and the Rockies and the uranium rush in the Four Corners area and the Black Hills are absent from the textbooks. The word oil is so tightly linked to the name John D. Rockefeller and thus to Pennsylvania, Ohio, and the Midwest that the Western oil industry has to settle for at best a sentence recording its most recent rise and fall in the 1970s and 1980s or perhaps the vexing problem of oil spills. The Western tourism industry, which has become in many parts of the West the most ongoing support of the economy, the most important support of the economy, the Western tourism industry has no history. Similarly, the ongoing instability of Western mining and cattle raising cannot register in textbooks where those two industries turn corporate, calm, predictable, and dull before 1890. The West departs as a unit of study after 1890, and important regional characteristics and patterns cannot even be named. None of the textbooks note the Trans-Mississippi West status as the region with the greatest urban concentration of population. No textbooks, textbook remarks on the West's good fortune as the region receiving the greatest per capita benefits from the New Deal, and no author notes the West's particularly strong association arising out of World War II with military and nuclear enterprises. No author discusses the West as a region where, except for the coastal Pacific Northwest, scarce water remains a permanent challenge. The West is the only part of the nation that shares a land border with an under underdeveloped country. The West is the part of the nation with the most direct Pacific Basin ties. The West is the site of the vast majority of the public lands and of the largest Indian reservations. These are regional characteristics and qualities that the textbooks leave for students to notice on their own. So, in truth, the omissions were amazing, and sometimes even the inclusions were more puzzling. There were uh, two or three textbooks that referred to anger in the West in the 1970s over the public lands. Those same books said nothing about the origin of the public lands or where the public lands came from. So, there are Westerners going into a tizzy about something that has no history and came from nowhere. So rather than thinking that I was beating a dead horse, I ended up thinking that there was indeed a real cause here simply to say the West is part of this story. I have not really dared to look to see if anything changed in the textbooks after you have had the experience of reading 12 two-volume textbooks closely one after the other. You sort of promise yourself that you'll never have to do that again. So I don't know how much impact my article had, but it's a comfort to know that it's ensconced in the public record, both in the Journal of American History and in Something in the Soil, ready to make the Eastern Provincialist squirm whenever that opportunity should come up. Now, um, in, in the 10 or 12 years which I was doing these speeches and essays, I did get the chance to realize that while my four C's were accurate, there was a lot more complexity in them than I might have realized. I knew that it was important to study the experience of the West from the point of view of many people coming from different directions. I didn't realize how much I had stayed in the habit of thinking in the usual directions myself. In 1992, I was asked uh, also by the Journal of American History to do an article, part of the observation of the Columbian, uh, Columbian quincentenary. I was supposed to write an article on the discovery of the American landscape. And at that point, I realized how much my own sense of the discovery of the American landscape was still hooked up with Lewis and Clark, with John C. Fremont, with the famous fo folks moving from east to west, taking humid as normal, taking well watered as normal, and then encountering the west and being surprised by its aridity. So for that essay, I tried practically and realistically to reverse the direction and write about the Asian and Asian American encounter with the landscape and simply go the other way. But I started with a story from my own experience. Um, so again, I grew up in Southern California and lived there until I went to graduate school. 
In the month of September in the year 1972, I traveled from the Pacific coast to the Atlantic coast, from Southern California to Southern New England. To the east of Arizona lay wilderness, and the exotic names of that wilderness both chilled and lured me. Tennessee, Virginia, the District of Columbia, Philadelphia, and most alarming of all, Manhattan. In the course of this journey, I discovered the eastern United States, an event as consequential to me as it was in insignificant to the residents. As I drove across Oklahoma, crossing what I later learned was the 98th meridian, discovery joined up with its usual partner, disorientation. The air became humid, clammy, and unpleasant, and the landscape turned distressingly green. The eastern United States, I learned with every mile, was badly infested by plants. Even where they had been driven back, the bushes, shrubs, and trees gave every sign of anticipating a reconquest. But the even more remarkable fact was this. Millions of people lived in this muggy, congested world, and most astonishing of all, they considered it normal. So there was my effort to say uh, that it would be fun to switch the perspective. And then what to me was really most striking and stimulating, I assumed when I began this, that this business of writing uh, in literary ways and appreciation of nature, appreciation of the Western landscape, I thought that was sort of the property of white Americans in the West. The nature appreciators, I thought, were Joseph Wood Crooch and his predecessors. Uh, what I learned, of course, is that this is a human desire, a human expression. And up and down the Pacific coast, uh, with Chinese immigrants and then later with Japanese immigrants, there were magazines publishing poems, competitions for poems. And so people who were working outdoors in the field, working under very tough circumstances, were composing haiku in their heads while they were working and submitting them to these, um, to these magazines. Plus, of course, people imprisoned and uh, detained, I beg your pardon, detained in Angel Island. Those people were writing poems about the view of San Francisco Bay from the immigration um, detention center. So it turned out that there was really quite a rich literary tradition of Asian and Asian American people in their encounter with the West. It was, in fact, possible to reverse directions and to recognize that some of the farming successes, for instance, that Asian American people came really fr came from their own, they were the ones who noticed the mustard growing wild in California and thought, hmm, mustard, where white Americans were thinking, oh, weed, got to get rid of that. They were the ones who saw a useful crop there. So there's a very interesting and complicated story to match, to go with, to complement the story of uh, white Americans encountering nature. So it turns out that this convergence thing has dimensions that I really didn't see coming, but turn out to be even richer and more interesting than I thought. For continuity, the uh, opportunity I had there, these, what my friend Greg Denny calls metric moments are glorious opportunities for historians. A lot of people, nobody in this room, but a lot of people go around paying no attention to history until it gets to a round number. And then when it is 100 years or 150 years, then it is time to pay attention. And this kind of metric enthusiasm. It's a, it seems to me these things are important whatever the year. It can be an odd-numbered year and it's still an important thing. But if, if human beings respond to this, then we better go along with that. So I have had quite a number of opportunities of being trotted out on sesquicentennials and so on. Uh, for the California Gold Rush, there was quite, I guess it was, might have been important in revealing that the California State Commission that was going to orchestrate the observation of the California Gold Rush fell apart in feuding and in accusations of embezzlement which might have been exactly the right way to celebrate the California. <laughs> hmm, I hadn't thought about that until this moment, but in any case, a lot of things that were supposed to happen for the sesquicentennial didn't quite happen, but the Oakland Museum did a spectacular exhibit on the gold rush and had a symposium to um, launch that, and that's where I had the opportunity in preparing for that to notice what had really gone past my attention, as well as I think most Americans, that in the same, uh, in the 1980s and in the 19... 1990s, there was a gold rush in the American West that exceeded, came close to, and then exceeded the production of the California gold rush. Uh, more gold being pulled out of the American West in our own time period than in the much romanticized, much uh, dreamed of and imagined gold rush. So that was a really interesting thing to look to see. Let me read a little uh, about that. In the mid-1980s, various authorities had announced the end of precious metal mining in the West. Right after they announced this, Western gold mining started off on a boom which has equaled the extraordinary productive productivity of the early 1850s in California. 
Right after we got these various epitaphs and obituaries for Western gold mining, the industry launched what the New York Times called a new gold boom, the biggest in American history. The Carlin Trend, which is the area in Nevada that had the richest resources, the Carlin Trend, the Times said, is the most important gold discovery outside South Africa this century, the largest known deposit of gold in North America. In terms of production, High Country News has called it the largest gold rush in American history, a gold boom that matches or even dwarfs any in the history of the West. The secret, of course, turned out to be low-grade ore, ore with microscopic gold, ore that never caused anyone to exclaim Eureka, because no one can see that it's there. This is gold that would be perfectly useless if all we had was the methods of the 19th century, or for that matter, the methods of much of the 20th century. The current gold boom relies on the process of open pit mining, by which a tremendous amount of rock gets, suck, gets dug up and crushed, and the process of cyanide heap leaching, by which a cyanide solution gets poured over the pounded up ore, and the cyanide captures the gold and positions it where humans can recover it. The center of this new gold boom has been Nevada, and especially the area around Elko, that 40-mile stretch called the Carlin Trend. But the enthusiasm for microscopic gold, secured by the use of cyanide leaching, has hit lots and lots of places in the interior west, so that the last decade has seen a proliferation of these open pits. An open pit mine is a hard thing to describe on words. On sight, the, the scale shakes the mine. As a poor substitute, consider the dimensions of American Barracks Gold Strike Mine near Elko. The pit in 1992 was two miles long, three quarters mile wide, and 1,800 feet deep. A reporter taking a plane flight over the mines outside Elko struggled for words and finally could only say, I am dumbfounded by the scale. For a few weeks, I asked all sorts of people if they could identify the term Carlin Trend. While I got a few guesses about the possible influence of George Carlin, <laughs> I earned almost entirely blank stares. This has left me with a great curiosity about the workings of public attention. Here we have a gold rush which dwarfs any mining activity in the preceding century, and it has earned from the public a great yawn. Well, obviously, that just gives us a wonderful opportunity to think about what it is that mesmerizes us about these events when they occur in the past and causes us to yawn in the present. And that uh, was a fine opportunity to reflect on the context of, well, that mining goes on, and yet it goes on with so few laborers, such in such a mechanized way that it simply lacks the color and the drama that we want when we are going to celebrate a resource boom. The conquest, uh, the third C. In this book, I finally had to reckon with something I had tried uh, my best to evade. When I was working on the legacy of conquest, I think it was Steve Foreman, not Ed Barber at Norton, who said, interesting, it's called the legacy of conquest, and there are no wars in this book. I said, I have a reason for that. You have to have reasons when you're talking to editors. You always have to have reasons, I said. It's a very easy thing to explain. People end up conquered. Indian people end up conquered regardless of whether they fight a war or not. The Pawnee people, the Crow people, did not fight the whites in a direct war, and they ended up on reservations, and they ended up in a conquered state. So I'm not going to do the wars. In fact, I think the reason I didn't do the wars is that they are uh, hard for a person who likes to believe the best about human beings. They're hard for a person in that situation to concentrate on. It's the only project I ever worked on where I was an insomniac, where I actually was um, staring at ceilings at two in the morning. Um, the brutality of the wars is uh, remarkable. And the fact that we could, to the degree we have been able to recover, th obviously they're much more vivid in Indian people's minds than they are in most white Americans, but I think it gave me, after my ordeal of, of facing up to this stuff, I think it gave me a sense of amazement and respect for human resilience, that, we, that this continent could have been through what it has been through and that we could have ended up living in some degree of peace. So I just want to read one short section from that and then I'm coming into port here in a moment. Uh, these Indian wars were often so bitter and so brutal that it is hard to imagine either how they ever turned romantic, picturesque, or fun in the works of American mythmakers, or how the survivors and their descendants were ever able to live in peace with each other. In the hands of novelists and filmmakers, the Indian white wars became spectacles with great entertainment value. Here is one of the greatest mysteries of the commercial manipulation of the story of westward expansion. Historical episodes in which human nature appeared at its worst provided novelists and movie makers with the material for what we call escapist fantasies. Escapist? 
In their true character, these stories raise profound questions about the reality of evil in human life, questions made even more compelling when they arise in a nation which has struggled to paint its history in shades of innocence. Rather than permitting the reader to escape the sorrows and troubles of the real world, these events force the reader's attention to the grimmest facts about Americans' origins. They are moral and spiritual muddles in which the line between good guys and bad guys, victim and villain, twist and meander and intertwine. And yet by the powerful alchemy of selective storytelling in American popular culture, narratives of great complexity became simple stories <coughs> of adventure and heroism and triumph with perhaps just a tinge of melancholy. Just as mysterious is the process by which peace was restored and a kind of coexistence arranged. When you have been thinking about the injuries and outrages committed in the course of these wars, a century does not seem like enough time to restore the peace. A story that Westerners tell to make fun of Easterners brings this issue to a focus. A car full of tourists from New Jersey pulls up at a gas station in a remote Western setting. We notice there's an Indian reservation up ahead, the tourists say to the gas station attendant. It's getting close to sunset. Are we going to be safe if we try to cross the reservation after dark? Well, says the gas station attendant, whose sister owns the motel next door, I'd be very careful about that. But your timing is good. The weekly army convoy leaves tomorrow at 7 in the morning. <laughs> if you wanted to get a room at the motel tonight, then you could be sure you'll be safe tomorrow. Now, this story usually presents a fine opportunity to laugh at the fools of the eastern United States. But when you have been reading the stories of Indian white wa warfare, considering the full measure of bitterness and brutality in those events, and recognizing how short a period of time a century is, the notion of waiting for the 7 a.m. convoy does not seem like such a foolish idea. And yet at some point the participants in these wars and their descendants broke the cycle of revenge and retaliation and ceased to think of each other's destruction as a desirable goal. In the United States of the late 20th century, the descendants of the Indians and the descendants of the white settlers are not killing each other. We take that turn of events for granted, but for someone immersed in the history of the Indian White Wars, this outcome appears remarkable, surprising, and even illogical. Continued theft and manipulation of Indian resources, restrictions on Indian religious freedom, arbitrary and damaging federal intervention in reservation affairs, poverty, unemployment, alcoholism, discrimination, prejudice, and bitter memories. There is nothing cheerful in those various manifestations of the legacy of conquest. But it is still a considerable relief when the flow of blood slows down and the guns fall silent. So that um, was something I had hoped to avoid and finally faced up to and flee <laughs> every moment. I still, I have a, just an irrepressible cheer and that whole subject matter still is something I'm wimpy about. One of the things we do at our Center of the American West at the University of Colorado is we go, uh, and Ed has gone with us, we go to see the sheepdog trials in Meeker, Colorado. Meeker is in the northwest corner of Colorado, and it's a very interesting area, and they have these sheepdog trials in September. One of the th watching the dogs work with the humans is enormous fun and really entrancing, and time just races by. Uh, one of the commands that the humans use with the dogs is can be either whistled or spoken, the human says, look back to the dog. And that is, uh, the dog is supposed to stop what it's doing, look over its shoulder. Usually it is not great news. Usually it is, oh, those humans have put another set of sheep behind me and now I'm supposed to go back and get them or I let a sheep get, a, get away. But it is that command which becomes entrancing. Look back, look back. And I think in human circles as opposed to sheepdog circles, it's more often than not good news. It's orienting, it's valuable. Um, it's useful to do that rethinking process. And indeed, in this book, there are quite a number of moments of my looking back at what I said and then looking further back at history to see if I said it right. I am entirely aware of the one element of the 1987 limerick that I do not have any claim on and don't want to have anything to do with. That was the dumb limerick, the limerick that I was, uh, the silly limerick. Silly, well, that's the name limerick. <laughs> it's suddenly striking me. This is waiting to be a limerick. But in any case, the, the foolish limerick who thought that the way to deal with people's belief in the Western myth was to take it on head on, to correct it, to fact check it, to move directly on these myths and correct them. I have now the world's deepest respect for how uh, wrong I was in that and how much it's really 
uh, how much I miss the fact that human belief is guides behavior. You, you don't remove the myth as if you were removing a dandelion from a, from a, well, you remove that the way I remove dandelions from the lawn, which is that they grow back um, the next day after I've tried to remove them. Myths are very persistent, they're very deep-rooted, and they give mooring to people, they give guidance to people, and simply coming in to fact-check them is really not a very useful exercise. So I believe the limerick who wrote something in the soil is a person who's become much more respectful of that need of people for those guiding myths. Uh, one last story and I'll be through. Uh, what brought this, uh, the quickest learner on this particular count of knowing that I must work much more congenially, much more collaboratively with people's beliefs if I'd like to invite them to a more realistic way of thinking about the West, the moment that brought it to a focus where even a somewhat slow learner like me couldn't miss it. I was in Santa Fe and I was with 30 or 35 uh, foreign scholars, professors from many different countries, and the last day we were there, they were having a competition. The competition was, was set up, who, whichever one of them was most, had their childhood understanding of the West most warped by the movies. That was the person who was going to win a copy of my book. So the day before, they had been at a tour of Acoma Pueblo, and they had all learned the word Kiva, the sacred place in a in a Pueblo. So various people from Austria, from, my goodness, there's no part of the planet where this has not been a significant uh, shaping force on children. We're talking about the Western movies they saw as, as children and how this shaped their thinking. Senegal, Philippines, you name it, people were putting their cases. Finally, a woman from uh, Poland who was p planning not to compete but finally was so, so angered by the cynicism that we were showing. She plunged in and she said, I was not going to compete and I don't want that book, but I will tell you, she said, I grew up in Poland and I grew up in tough times. And as a child, when I was a child, my father read to me those Karl Mayer my stories about the West and that meant everything to me. He read them to me before I could read, as soon as I could read, those were the books I read. And she was just getting more intense each sentence. She said, when I was a child, uh, I finally saw a Karl Mayer movie and the fact that Old Shatterhand was played by a fat Frenchman, even that did not disillusion me, she said. <laughs> and her last sentence, she said, you may tell me whatever you like about the real West, but I will tell you that Karl Mai is the Kiva in my soul. <laughs> I have learned respect. So the limerick before you is the one who learned respect. And thank you very much for your attention.